Right. Hey, Who's Ryan. excited for our 15th Layer 1 conversation? <laughs> no. I just feel the excitement radiating off of you. Oh, uh, I know. No, it's, you know, this is a good crowd. We should talk about Cardano more often. Sure. I've sure. spent the last five years consciously avoiding it, ignoring <laughs> it, criticizing it. <laughs> Or at least he, according to you on Twitter, well, you know. Well, you know, I can so look here at you are on the main stage. Search, search for Ada, search for Cardano, not a single mention, All right. pages. All right, here okay. we go. Okay. So we're, we're going to start off with a bang here. Um, Cardano has taken a different approach to shipping and, and kind of getting its ecosystem up and running and, and building. Um, and it is one of the largest assets in crypto. Top 10 asset. Um, you have a big milestone today, a hard fork that's going into effect, Bastille. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that a little bit. But I want to start because fairly or unfairly, I think uh, you uh, have, or the project maybe has been criti criticized in some circles or even ignored in some circles. I'd, like to, I'd love to hear from you what, um, what is going right with the project right now? What do you... What do you think some people miss, or what do you think some of the misperceptions of Cardano are that are most frustrating? So I want to basically give you the floor sure. to, uh, to get it all off your chest, and then we can get into the rest of the conversation. <laughs> and, and like, let's use that as a level set, because I don't think I'm the only one, right? I think, um, sure. I think we, we, we look at a lot of shiny objects in the industry. We look at, you know, uh, Mo is talking about the four test nets that Aptos has done yesterday. Yeah. We see you know, a lot of uh, kind of narrative momentum around the merge. But um, you know, you've been plugging along in the, and you know, the, the performance of the asset has been terrific. Uh, now it's a question of you know, where, where's the ecosystem going next? So yeah, OK, so let's level set. First off, people have to understand that layer ones, if you're not careful, any and dApps as well are unstable elements. Like Luna is a great example of that. If you have poor design, you can collapse overnight if you run into a certain failure event. And if you look at poor design for consensus, like you look at Ethereum's consensus algorithm, you run into a scenario where 40% of the uh, block producers are just two people, and then your money's locked for an indefinite period of time. You have no liquidity. So you might have achieved security and perhaps allowed you to pursue a roadmap, but then people from a usability perspective say, well, hang on a second here. This is not what I signed up for. So one of the things we did with Cardano way back in the day is we started from Bitcoin as a base. We kind of ignored a lot of other stuff. And we said, well, what did Bitcoin get right? And what did Bitcoin get wrong? So Bitcoin got a beautiful consensus algorithm, proof of work right. And we said, can we replicate those properties in the proof of stake world? We like that a lot. We like the inclusiveness. We like the 15% Byzantine resistance. We like the asynchrony. We like all these things. These are phenomenal properties. So we have to mathematically describe them. So we wrote a paper. It's the most, one of the most cited papers in the entire cryptography industry for cryptocurrency, over 3,000 citations, the GKL paper. And it basically created a security model for Bitcoin. Then from that, we had a basis upon which to build a proof of stake algorithm. And we wrote more than a dozen papers now with Ouroboros. And they're among the most cited of all papers in cryptocurrencies. And that gave us a, a good engine that had Bitcoin-like properties, but lives in the proof-of-stake space with all the upside of proof-of-stake. And we said, well, look, if we can just get that right, then that alone is something that's worth a lot to people, because Bitcoin's worth a lot to people, and people are eventually going to want something like this. But then we wanted to go a step further and say, well, what else did Bitcoin get right? The UTXO model was very prescient. What Satoshi came up with was this beautiful functional structure that eventually would allow you to do lots of cool things off chain. And if you look at where the entire industry is going, you've got these guys, data availability proofs, ZK rollups, state channels, this, that, the other. They're really talking about we have something happening outside of our system that we will take a proof to validate inside of our system. And by doing this, we get interoperability and scale. That's how it should work. Well, if you're in an accounts-based model, it's really hard to do that. And everybody's starting to learn about this. Whereas the UTXO model, it's actually a lot easier to do that. The problem with it is that UTXO was never built for smart contracts. They tried. It was horrible. They had an inflation bug that nearly killed Bitcoin. So they decided to run away from that. So we spent four years thinking about how do you do it. We built the extended UTXO model, and we designed it. So every step of the way with Cardano, we just basically said we're going to start from something that makes sense. We're going to write papers. 
We're going to validate those papers in the academic community. There's now over 150 of them that we've written as an ecosystem by top professors. We have a lab at Stanford. We have a lab at CMU. We have people in Europe, at Edinburgh, people in Japan at Tokyo Institute of Tech. And then through an evidence-based way, we're going to roll it out. And so it's built this great community that basically says, look, these guys eventually will get there. They're eventually going to figure it out. And wherever they get to, it's probably going to be something that works and it's global scale. And there's a humongous appetite in our industry for that, especially during bear markets. You don't capture anything during the bull market, but during the bear market, everybody's collapsing. All the bridges are getting hacked. Uh, all these DeFi Ponzi schemes fall apart uh, that we keep saying are problems. So that's the community we've built and the ecosystem we've built. Now we are enjoying the dividends of that approach. We're doing a hard fork today. I'm not sweating because we built an incredible upgrade system called the hard fork combinator. In just about three hours, it's out. I don't worry that it's going to be problematic and the network's going to break. We're literally updating a $15 billion asset with a 3 million person community on 200 plus exchanges. And it's just an event for us, like many others. Because we thought, how do you upgrade these things? For the consensus algorithm, we talked like, how do you scale Ethereum? Well, we already wrote all the papers on how to scale Ouroboros, so we know how to do it. It just implement it. It might take a year. It might take two years as an inevitability, though, and it's there when you need it. For the transaction models, people talk about TPS. With extended UTXO, you have transactions per transaction. One transaction could be hundreds of transactions in an accounts-based model. And that's great for roll-ups. That's great for accumulators. That's great for off-chain traffic and so forth. So, you know, that's always been the philosophy. Maybe that's not your cup of tea. That's fine. It's a big industry. But we, you have to acknowledge that more than half of the value of this industry does believe in that because they hold Bitcoin and they believe in those slow, methodical principles. The other thing is Fortune 500 companies, governments, real actors that are in charge of millions to billions of people, they care about standards, they care about safety, they care about reliability, they care about consistency, they care about interoperability, they care about good governance. You get one of these clients on board, you have 3 billion users. Meanwhile, 98% of the people in the world don't use cryptocurrency for anything other than speculation. So we have yet to see mass adoption, we have yet to see mass embracing. In fact, regulations moving in a direction that we were now talking about things like, well, how do you do regulated DeFi? How do you do uh, certified wallets or KYC AML on transactions? These types of things. That's where the VWrite standards are coming from and these other things. We kind of pre-built everything in that particular direction that things work well in a standard space approach. We're one of the most decentralized of all cryptocurrencies. 74% of the supply is staked and liquid at the same time. Over 3,000 stakeful operators. And the way the system is built, 10 years from now, it'll be probably an order of magnitude greater. So it gets more decentralized over time. So when you look at it in the micro, there's nothing for the speculators because it's not sexy. But when you look at it over the macro trend, once you gain a user, they tend to stay. They tend to be loyal to the brand. They tend to want to build something inside the brand. You know, we, there's a lot of self-inflicted wounds. I was overly optimistic about how quickly we could move with the development model. We literally had to rewrite all the code uh, about two years ago, three years ago with the Byron reboot. I was a little optimistic about how long it would take to go from research paper to an actual solution in market. Because I said, oh, if we have the paper, we can do it in six months to a year. Some of these papers take three years to implement and so forth. But I'll just give you a sense of where the dividends have paid off. There's Mina, and there's Cello, and all these other things. They say constant size blockchain. We want to have a blockchain that, uh, that you know, I can have a light client and have full node security. OK. And they have tons of engineers. And they spend tens of millions of dollars, and they're pursuing this heavy thing. One paper, Mithril, that we published last year with a team of just three people does that for Cardano. And it's 24 weeks of engineering. We're now in a beta test with the stakeful operators using it. It'll be in our wallets in the next six to nine months. And that's one thing that also can be used for scalability, off-chain voting, interoperability between different side chains and so forth. And we get that with a very simple cryptographic primitive, the threshold signature. Why? Because we thought about it. While we were designing Ouroboros in 2016, we said, you know, we're going to need side chains. We're going to need off-chain stuff. We have all these things. Can we do the hard heavy lifting now and design this framework so that I can just plug a simple solution in? Meanwhile, all these other people are trying to take older systems and retrofit them to have capabilities they were never intended to do. 
and then they suddenly have to spend years scratching their head thinking about it, like seven years for Ethereum to get proof of stake integrated. It took us just a few years to actually turn that on. So, you know, well, it's, not, it's not everybody's cup of tea, you know, and I get that, I appreciate that, and, you know, reasonable people can disagree, but one thing that's clear is we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere, we're going to stay where we're at, and we're going to keep growing in that respect. Well, are you building the platonic ideal of a race car, or are you building a race car? I think that's the question. Because yeah, but we've already built both. We, it's uh, working today. Well, it's there. You, know, you, mentioned, you mentioned the hard fork today, and you mentioned it's a $15 billion asset that list, that's listed on a couple hundred exchanges, and we're not sweating the hard fork. What about everyone in the community, right? Like where, you know, when, when I think about like the conversations that some of these other ecosystems have when they have a major upgrade, it's about where are the potential issues, what do we have to look at, in terms of applications breaking, in terms of some of the kind of, uh, infrastructure providers across the ecosystem having a breaking change or creating some type of disruption for end users and customers, those tends to be the things that I think some of the other developer ecosystems are, are focused on. And you're saying this was a seamless upgrade, I didn't lose any sleep over it, it's all been formally verified. Is that because not enough people are using Cardano? No, that's not true at all, because here's the thing. We have 120 dApps that are upgrading. You know, and there's tons of stuff in infrastructure. There's more than a dozen wallets. So when you build a smart contract system, you have two options. You can either start from maximum expressiveness, that's what, like the JVM or something, and kind of ratchet it down and make the EVM. And then every time you find a performance, a security issue or something, you have to reduce the expressiveness of the system. When you do that, whoever's using those new things, it breaks. It doesn't work for them anymore. So every upgrade, you're thinking, God, I, I lose compatibility. It's like, go, it's like this endless cycle of who do I keep happy, who do I not keep happy. Or you can go in the other direction with minimal expressiveness, and every time you upgrade, you add, which you, but means you have backwards compatibility. So it's like going from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to Windows 10. Your Windows 7 apps work. So here, we have two versions now on Ledger of Plutus. Plutus 1, Plutus 2. So I don't sweat because the people using Plutus 1 come hard fork are still using Plutus 1. And every hard fork in Cardano is built this way. It's a superset of the prior node. So the Bi uh, Byron era stuff works today. Shelly era stuff works today. Gogan era stuff works today. Basho era stuff will work tomorrow and you never lose any compatibility in that. And we pre-designed the system with this in mind, so it meant it's forever upgradable. You know, and a friend of mine actually told me to do this, I was Stephen Wolfram. So if you take a Wolfram program from, that was written in the 1980s in his little Wolfram language that he has, it'll still run today on Mathematica with no changes because he built the language with that capability of upgradability in that respect. Now it's much more expressive, so what was written in the 80s was much simpler, similar to Plutus V1 is much simpler, and if you want to take advantage of the new features, namely a huge increase in performance and 10x reduction in transaction size and transaction cost and these things, you have to rewrite the program in the new language, but you still have backward compatibility. You know, and that's fair, right? You're talking a lot about the infrastructure improvements and the version by version upgrades and, and you know, kind of iteratively getting better over time. But again, my question is, what does success look like from an end usage on the platform? Well, you've got a vendor outside, World Mobile. They're literally building an ISP that's launching this year on Cardano's network with two million users. That's success. We're creating a micro well, ISP. Let's, let's talk about those, right? That's sure. launching later this year. Anything else in the meantime? Sure. You, kind of where, where, you have where, that. Where, you have 10 plus on? DEXs on Cardano from Sunday Swap to Wing Riders. Some are quite innovative, like Wing Riders is actually a hybrid that it runs on an Ethereum side chain of Cardano with a bridge to Ethereum to bring a stable coin in. By the way, that's the only hack I've ever lost money in because Nomad was hacked, and I think I lost some uh, coins there. But, you know, they run. Uh, there's uh, MinSwap, Mina. Jed is a stable coin that Cody's launching. It's, a, it's an over-reserved algorithmic stable coin that's on, and I argue much, much better design than Luna. You got oracles that are in the system that people are developing. Orbis is doing a whole roll-up solution for the system. Um, we have great partnerships around, like Wanchain's building a bridge to Cardano. It's a rich and vibrant ecosystem. What I'm tired about is people saying it's a ghost chain. It's like, just go to Cardano Cube and look at the damn list, and there's so many dApps that are there. We have a huge NFT ecosystem. 
Over 5 million native assets have been launched on Cardano. Talk about the story of Bitcoin. Where did we get our native asset model from? We got it from Color Coins. In 2012, they were talking about this. We said, that's a good idea. The problem is Bitcoin doesn't understand it. So we took that design and we brought it into Cardano, and now you have native assets. It's significantly easier to issue an asset on Cardano because it's treated and accounted for the same way as ADA. Second, we have th a technology called Babel Fees that's coming out, which allows you to pay transaction fees in the native asset. So it's as if you had your own blockchain. You don't have to worry about it. We have privacy stuff that's on the horizon that's coming and so forth. But you know, you build it in layers. And so version one of Plutus was a great proof of concept and it allowed us to build a great dev community. They came to us, the Cardano DeFi Alliance, and they said things like, well, we need reference input and inline datums, and we need all these other things in order to build better apps. We said, sure, follow a standards-based approach. So they wrote SIP 31 and 32 and 33 and SIP 40. We implemented it and put it in Vossel. More than half of the things that are in this release coming in two hours and a half hours uh, or were from the community, where they actually said, we need these features to build something on Cardano. We said, great. If you follow standards process, we'll build it and import it. And that's what happened. Uh, so we, we have a great ecosystem in that respect. And, and we can't be everything to everyone, but I'm pretty happy when you have Snoop Dogg's son doing claimmates on the system. I'm pretty happy when you have major financial institutions say, hey, how do we get involved and support Cardano and do something? A lot of Swiss banks are doing it. I'm pretty happy when you've got guys launching internet balloons in Zanzibar and they find use and utility inside the ecosystem. That's where we're at today in a bear market. And the key is, can we keep evolving and keep adding and keep getting more functionality? The other thing is the co-evolution of the technology. So we have a technology called Hydra. It's uh, like a state channel system we've been building. This is a product where we get to co-build it with DAP developers. So every two weeks, there's a release cycle. Many of the DAP developers want it for scale because they want to do a lot of stuff off chain. So they come and give us requests and, as a development group, and we satisfy that and it makes their apps better. That's a vibrant ecosystem, and it's, it's growing exponentially. And I don't care if it's 10 or 15 or 20. What I care about is, what is that metric of growth? Where is it going to be in three years or five years? And when I look at everything from the amount of users on chain to the amount of delegated stake to the amount of transactions, which you guys record on your own framework, the amount of value being moved, everything actually is growing on Cardano at a pretty nice rate. Meanwhile, we keep what we have. People don't leave if they've tattooed the logo on their body and named their kid Ada and these types of things. They're just not going to leave. So you keep what you have, you keep growing, and you keep getting more capabilities, and every time you do it, you leave no one behind because you have backwards compatibility with what they've built in the past, which was Satoshi's point. If you're going, everything in Bitcoin works the same way as it worked January 3rd of 2009. Similarly, everything on Cardano works exactly the same way for a user who did something in 2017. But there's just new stuff for new users to use if they choose to do that. Do you think that VCs overlook the Cardano ecosystem? Some do, some don't. It just depends on the location. Is it a family office? Is it, I mean, certainly A16Z and others are like, eh, Cardano. But you know, the problem is that we didn't- Why do you think that is? Because we didn't have any Ponzonomics for them. I mean, let's be honest here. The vast majority of VCs, let's just be honest, the way they approach it is liquidity. So they say, when is the token coming out? Where's the marketplace for the token going to be? Do I get an early distribution? How do I exit that early distribution when the retail people come in? And you've seen numerous layer ones and dApps, we won't name names, where they launch to market at a very high, high valuation, the insider's dump, they go down, and they walk away with a lot of money. You know, and so there wasn't a lot of Ponzonomics to offer, and it was a fair distribution of Cardano. It's one of the, it has a great Gini coefficient. There's, it's one of the most distributed currencies in terms of distribution. So there was no insider distribution to go and sell. Some of these layer ones, which you guys track on your platform, the insider distribution is greater than 50%. So if you're a VC, you say, oh, wow, if I get involved in this, and I get 10% of the supply, and I could get 100x in six months, this is my favorite thing in the whole wide world. They look at Cardano and they say, well, where's that opportunity? We say, well, it doesn't exist. It's an egalitarian distribution. So ah, I, did, I got nothing for you. But you know, they'll get involved organically because greed, greed is their thing, and that's their fiduciary obligation to their LPs. So where they get involved is when you see multiple Cardano dApps start getting multi-billion dollar valuations. 
because there, there's something for them to invest in, there's something for them to connect to. So probably 2023, 2024, but it's important to understand that we have our own VC in the ecosystem, Catalyst, which has $500 million worth of ADA inside of it. And it's already funded probably about 12, 1300 different projects on Cardano, and it admits about 60 to 70 million per year, which is a realistic emission for where the ecosystem is at in terms of its need for incubation acceleration. The big issue we have in our industry is bizarre and outside valuations. You have ventures that are perhaps worth pre-money $20 million because you like the founders get a billion dollar valuation. That's not healthy. And the problem is they have an expectation of return, so where does the return come from? It comes from the retail investor who gets bamboozled and they lose 90% of their value very, very quickly. I've been in this space long enough to know that's not sustainable, it invites regulation, and then ultimately it's going to be closed off. So the only ecosystems that are going to survive are the ones that value hard work, and the ones that actually take time to construct things and build communities and create real value and so forth. Like what World Mobile's doing, for example, and what a lot of the other people in the uh, Cardano ecosystem are doing, but not just exclusively Cardano. There's plenty of projects in crypto space that have taken this viewpoint as well. And those are the ones I think will be here in 10 years and still in the top 10 in the 10 years, like Bitcoin. And frankly, Ethereum as well. Ethereum was funded for 18 million, that whole ecosystem. It's easy to forget that, you know? No VCs, by the way. Well, maybe the most contrarian play that you can make is to slow down in a fast uh, moving hyper volatile environment and don't break things, uh, which has been the approach that you all have taken and, and uh, looking forward to seeing the next year, a couple of years, uh, some of these new products come to fruition. The VC ecosystem emerging around the DAP environments and um, uh, hopefully in two hours or so, yeah. Art Fork goes off without a hitch. You seem confident, so. Uh, I'm, I sure, feel pretty I'm sure good. it'll be fine. I, I'm either going to be drinking very heavily tonight or it's going to be a good day, but I think it's, it's just going to be a good day. Well, it's going to coincide with the open <laughs> car. So. Uh, Charles, I appreciate you coming on yeah. and educating me and, and filling in the knowledge gaps that, uh, that I've, I've made so clearly obvious in my annual reports uh, by, by not giving you enough coverage. But I promise I'm going to write at least three sentences this year out of the 160 pages. Is that fair? That's immeasurably better than zero, right? <laughs> well, at least we had 25 minutes to start. So. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank I appreciate coming. this. Charles. Cheers. Thank you.